Very well. Okay, so we're streaming live. Right, right now, before I forget, I <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Now, yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Obi, how are you? Good morning, Excellency. How are you? Good. Yes, congratulations once again for the event last um, right. Sunday. It was Greetings, fantastic. everybody. How's everyone doing? Thank you. Okay. Hold on. Can, you hear? can everybody hear me? Yeah, everybody. I can hear you. Okay. Okay, good. So, good, brother, good. so brother James, before we begin, allow me to um, formally introduce to you His Excellency Bahani Solomon from the Embassy of Eritrea, um, Mr. Dawit Hale, the political counselor from the Embassy of Eritrea. Um, you already know Fravia. Um, Fravia yeah, Com yeah. Companera Fravia is here. And um, we're waiting, we're waiting for the Cuban ambassador and Lutendo from Zimbabwe, then we can get started. But I just wanted to formally introduce you to them before the panel started. This is the main, and Tier, Sister um, Tierney is here. And um, we also have um, a Time for Awakening podcast who will do some additional streaming. Brother Quake, who is here. Brother James, I just wanted to let you know that. Oh, Ruten, Rutendo is here. I saw Rutendo just coming. So Brother Rutendo is here. So I guess um, we're just waiting for Simon. Pretendo said he's in, but he can't see him, so. Yeah, I don't, let me see here. He's on the attendees. He's not on the panelists. Land. Him and Fravi are the attendee for some reason. I think I got everyone. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Leonis is here. Attendo. Mm -hmm. Everyone's on? Yeah. Um, Ambassador Bahani and um, Brother Dawit are here from the Eritrean Embassy. So if you said Ambassador um, Rivera is here. Okay. Um, Rivera. That should be, yeah, that, that's everyone. Pastor Solomon is here. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Solomon. And Tindo, Tyranny. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're good to go. Okay. Great. It's great. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start, re start recording now. Um, Greetings, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining this very, very important conversation today. Uh, thank you to our attendees and our panelists, of course. Uh, thank you to Tierney Sheree, uh, who is also uh, co-hosting or co-sponsoring uh, with a Recharge, I'm sorry, Recharge Colonialism uh, um, Coalition. Uh, and you know, honestly, this is the this is a very very important conversation. Um, there's been a number of conversations going on around sanctions, about sanctions, but not a, not specifically diving into the the deleterious impact of what sanctions are and what they are intending to do. But also uh, the 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 movements that are on the ground, the grassroots um, things that are happening on the ground uh, to. Um, to mitigate some of those things. But again, you know, the sanctions, the blockades, all of those particular things that, you know, we want to make sure that we address in today's conversation. And we have a, an esteemed uh, uh, pa uh, group of panelists and folk that are here uh, to do that. Um, and, with, and as before I introduce uh, um, the panelists, um, I want to allow Tyranny Sheree to just say a few words uh, about an upcoming event uh, our, our um, conference that are being put on. So I'll just kick it over to Tierney real quick. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Tierney. I represent the organization We Charge Colonialism. We're an anti-colonial organization uh, that organizes primarily out of the United States. Um, I'm happy to join this conversation because a lot of the work we've been doing, particularly with the convention that I'll mention, um, is directly targeting issues such as sanctions. But essentially, uh, this July 21st through 23rd, a coalition of African-led organizations are, um, we're creating, we, we've created a convention particularly around uh, the issue of, of neocolonialism, the abolition of neocolonialism. So the convention's name is Pan-African Unity or Parish, a call for the abolition of neocolonialism. And right along with the issue of sanctions, it will be uh, hosted as a hybrid conference, it'll be hosted inside of Zimbabwe, but also being um, held online. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that convention and the work that we're doing, AUMD, which is Africa Unity Movement for Decolonization, you could visit our website, wechargecolonialism.org. And uh, there's a tab on top that says AUMD, where it has more information about the convention and also other things that we've done together as a coalition of African-led organizations. So that's all I have on that. No, oh, thank you. And again, uh, recharge colonialism. And of course, when we hear recharge, as, as someone who understands <laughs> recharge, you this up. But I, you know, the 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 twist in the end on, on that particular uh, uh, sharpening exactly what that is about. So as we begin the conversation, one of the things that we want I wanted to do is to make sure that we have time uh, for our panelists to give their. Uh, to give their perspectives. And so as I do that, I just wanted to give a brief introduction and I will put introductions more uh, uh, more extensive as we are moving into, you know, as in the YouTube and all of those other particular things. But I wanted to make sure that we we highlight that we have Ambassador Rivera here uh, from the Cuban emb um, Embassy. We have uh, Ambassador Solomon here. Uh, we have Ambassador Duet. We also have at grassroots activists, uh, Rotendo is here as well. So I think that it's very, very important to really highlight uh, the, the, the the range and scope of, of folk who are actually here to really give a a real rounded, uh, real deeply uh, uh, um, um, understanding or, or explanation or exploration into the topic today. And of course, just to reintroduce, this is an explore, exploration of the structural and violent implications of sanctions, how sanctions threaten peace, stability, and development. Uh, this seminar is intended, our webinar is intended to explore as comprehensively as possible the structural implications, as well as highlight the various innovative community-based programs that have developed to mitigate the impact of the consequences of sanctions. But this latter point is important to spotlight the collective agency of communities in order to understand that there is an opportunity that we must move at a grassroots level, but also uh, uh, at, at the at the international level, the, the diplomatic level, in order to address these deadly consequences of, um, of sanctions. So in order of speaker, uh, given that time, uh, there are some time restrictions and we really appreciate everybody being able to do that. In order of speaker, we will go with Fabria, then we will go with Rotendo, and then we'll go to uh, with Ambassador Barani, then uh, Ambassador Simon, uh, and then we will end uh, this particular two-part conversation, uh, Ambassador Rivera. And what I'm, what, the reason why I say it's two-part is that we want to give, uh, the panelists have already been given a framework and I want them to address as best as possible and as comprehensively as possible those that framework. But then we want to make sure that the audience um, or that we have follow-up with any, any um, questions that uh, the audience may be able to have, a, uh, the, the attendees may have, but also any follow-ups that the panelists, because we want the panelists to talk to each other as well. That's important as well. Uh, so with that being said, we will start with Fabia uh, to give us, uh, to address the framework that, that was sent in the letter and we'll just go from there. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul. Good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today. And uh, well, I'm talking to all of you from Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, I have been asked to give a little briefing about who I am. Uh, my name is Fabia Marquez again. I'm a young, I am a career diplomat. I was appointed to Washington DC until 2019. And now I work um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the National Assembly. I am a foreign relations advisor to the first vice president of the National Assembly. 
And well, uh, as much of you may know, Venezuela has been hit by sanctions. Most of the people think it started in 2016 with the Obama decree, the executive order of Obama, that said that Venezuela was an unusual uh, threat to the national security of the United States. But actually, sanctions started in, in 2006. The first sanctions were regarding the spare parts for the military areas of Venezuela, and also some sanctions to individuals uh, from the government. Of course, that started moving Venezuela to look for a replacement in these areas, and it backlash because on the media you will see that we were getting closer to uh, so-called uh, enemies or terrorists like Russia or Iran or China. And it, as a matter of fact, was an effect of the sanctions that started in that moment. Right now, uh, as you may know, we have passed, uh, we had passed because we're still going through it, but we are better today. An amazing financial and economic war we are living under it. And um, I wish to, I want to share with you some numbers because I think it's very interesting how the sanctions has impacted the whole country, not, not only of course government, because the narrative of the US government is that sanctions are targeted and they really don't have impact on the people of Venezuela or the people of any country, because Venezuela is not the only country under sanctions, of course. For instance, I could tell you that more than 113 uh, officials of the government, but their families and citizens has been impacted directly by sanctions. We have the PDVSA, you know, we are an oil country, PDVSA is under sanctions, not only to export oil, but to produce. And we are not able to import all the chemicals we need for uh, refining, not even now. In the media, there is a narrative that sanctions are flexible, are more flexible now. Uh, and in the facts, that is not happened. Uh, three days ago, the uh, government office, the GAO, just published again the, this um, order when they authorized Chevron, which is one of the US, it is the only US company that is still in Venezuela, along with Halliburton and others, to continue to operate. The, the operations are reduced only to maintenance and guarding of their assets here and the personnel they have. They are not allowed to produce, to export, or anything yet. Also, uh, we have our uh, airline, our national airline, Combiasa, was sanctioned, so we cannot fly freely, and we have no direct flights to the United States, neither. And of course, as you know, airlines left Venezuela from, they started leaving, I think, four or five years ago, more than that. So that is also another obstacle in the relations or the development of the country, if you want to regard only the tourism area, if that would be one of the examples. Then regarding the, the rights of the people that have been uh, affected is the right to health. We have been very vocal as a government uh, explaining that there has been uh, children losing, and I want to give you some numbers about uh, losing the right or the opportunity to have operations abroad. We used to use our uh, oil company, Citgo, who is in the United States, to do social uh, work with the people of Venezuela, the Venezuelan citizens, and sometimes also with the US citizens, like the heating and oil program we had in place during winter in, in the East Coast, mainly of the United States. But after sanctions heated and the US government recognized the Wikipedia government of Juan Guaido, as we call it, that has stopped and we haven't been able to address these issues. If we go to the health, to the water sector, for instance, we have numbers that the, the amount of water, the access of water of uh, any regular seating in Venezuela has been reduced from 416 cubic meters we had per person in 2013 to 262 cubic meters in 2018. 
and uh, the the loss of the oil barrels per day, for instance, at the end of 2019, were around circling the 116 million dollars. Venezuela used to produce close to three million barrels monthly, two and a half, more or less. Today, we're barely reaching now 500,000 or more. Uh, also, uh, the consequences, I want to give you other numbers I have here, the medical equipment, surgeries, uh, we, there has been 1,000 uh, less in like surgeries in our hospitals per year after sanctions. We have uh, go back in all the social development we had, like we were a free uh, literacy country. And now we have, it has been a struggle for the government to keep the spending in all the social areas, in the health areas. Even though it has been a priority for the government, the government has not stopped spending money and listening to the needs of the people. They have reinvented the way they bring the the all the benefits to the people to try to make it more direct but as you may know also importing food has been a nightmare for us our accounts have been frozen as a government any account that had venezuelan government on its name was frozen and the money is there they just robbed it after why though they decided some of the banks to give it to them i'm not going even to go into the issue of the gold and the United Kingdom, because that's a whole another topic for a discussion, but it has impacted all of our spending and our capacity to buy. And that's why we use uh, diplomats or individualities to try to bring food to Venezuela. You may have listened or known about Alex Saab, who is currently uh, being hostage in the US. He was kidnapped. And what was he doing is try to uh, circumvent the sanctions around the globe to bring food and medicine for the people of Venezuela. That is one of the examples we can talk about more later. So the public revenue has been reduced by 99%. Uh, the country lives on 1% of its pre-sanctions income. Um, the amount of dollars, the million of dollars set of the Venezuelan assets frozen in banks in the States and the UK and Portugal, only those three, it's uh, around $6,000, 6 million, $6,000, uh, it would be six, $6,000 million. Um, also, uh, the private sector and their organizations and the universities, most of the sectors are reluctant, of course, to deal with Venezuela because that is what we call the overcompliance of sanctions. You said, okay, the only sanction is this minister and this company, and that's all no, but no one wants to risk their business or their government to have an issue with the, one of the biggest powers in the earth, who is the United States or the European Union, who has been also imposing sanctions on Venezuela. So that is closing even more our uh, range of action. Also, uh, the impediments to food imports are around, uh, have made that more than 2.5 million of Venezuela uh, are suffering of food insecure. But, uh, and, and what has been happening in Venezuela until last year is that the population, to cope with the situation, they reduced the meal intake. So this is affecting the nutrition. This is affecting the whole people, the children. And we, after the, um, during the pandemic, the sanctions didn't stop. We were imposed, I think, around 15 more sanctions during the pandemic in 2020, even though there was a humanitarian I would say humanitarian crisis around the world. And uh, the, the hospitals, even though in Venezuela, the hospital never were overflow like other countries. Thanks to the policies of the government, we went into quarantine very early uh, in March, 2020. And the government was able to, to deal with the situation. And also the population was very disciplined. I have to recognize that even though we are Caribbean people, majority Afro-descendants, and we tend to be, you know, people that are, is always in touch, so close, touchy to each, even touchy to each other. 
we were very disciplined about the measures and the the, the amount of the, the death rate in Venezuela is very low. One of the lowest compared to, to the hemisphere, to the Western hemisphere. And well, I don't know if I leave it till there, so uh, we can have a discussion later and I'll let my colleagues to speak. Thank you very much. No, thank thank you very much for uh, that that very important uh, outline of, of what's of what's happening uh, right now and currently. Uh, we will go to uh, Rotundo. Uh, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. Right, my name is Rotundo. I am from Zimbabwe Anti Sanctions Movement, or what we call ZASM. So we're an organization that was created to fight US, EU, and UK sanctions, and basically sanctions from the Western world that were imposed on Zimbabwe by the Western world. And the sanctions that were imposed on Zimbabwe were imposed on Zimbabwe after we undertook land reform, took land that had been uh, colonized and taken by the colonizer, gave it back to our people, and then the Western world decided to impose sanctions on Zimbabwe. They imposed a number of sanctions. The first were congressional sanctions that were imposed by the Congress of the United States, and they were called ZIDERA, Zimbabwe um, uh, Democracy and uh, Economic Recovery Bill, which is totally the opposite of that because it has actually destroyed our economy. Now, this very first set of congressional sanctions were imposed on the government of Zimbabwe together with its parastatals to deny them access to loans from multilateral lending institutions, and more importantly, to deny them cancellation of colonial debts. Now, you need to understand the importance of blocking the cancellation of colonial debts was because after 90 years of colonialism, Zimbabwe was entitled to a development grant that was given by the Western countries in order to try and stop our government from getting reparations. So instead of paying reparations after we won the war against our uh, oppressors, they decided to say, we will give you grants. And those grants will not be given upfront, but they will actually be given as debts that will be canceled in future after our government has developed the infrastructure, developed the social, uh, social uh, uh, projects that were required for the native peoples that they were denied during colonialism in contravention of the UN Charter. So by denying Zimbabwe the cancellation of these debts, what it is that the United States, the Europeans and the United Kingdom were doing is they were basically denying Zimbabwe the ability to get back what was lost during colonialism colonialism and in order for them to cancel debts that were incurred because of the colonial legacy of underdevelopment. And so by denying Zimbabwe loans that were supposed to be reconstruction and development after the war of independence, that war of independence was also accompanied by UN sanctions that were imposed on the colonizer. But in reality, those sanctions that were imposed on the, by the UN on the colonizer actually underdeveloped this new Zimbabwe that would be independent, put into black hands, and when it needed to develop itself from that underdevelopment, we are then denied of the loans to build schools, roads, hospitals, and infrastructure for electricity. So what this has done, these congressional sanctions have done, is they've basically reinstituted the colonial underdevelopment, and they've also put the impact of the sanctions that were put by the UN on Rhodesia or the colonial power, they've actually multiplied the effect of that underdevelopment, deindustrialization, by the impositions of this con uh, congressional sanctions. We then have another set of sanctions that were imposed on Zimbabwe, which are supposedly the targeted sanctions. These are the executive order sanctions of the United States. They were imposed by the president through uh, presidential executive orders. And this was after the United States President George Bush in 2001 declared Zimbabwe a threat to U.S. interests, U.S. economic uh, interests, and U.S. foreign policy interests in the region. So what that basically meant is that even though it is not defined in clear terms, because Zimbabwe had taken its land, given it to Black people, and with that land came the power to control the resources of that land, Zimbabwe, its government and its politicians were deemed to be threats 
to use U.S. economic interest, U.S. foreign policy interests, and U.S. economic interests. And we believe that that was the case because if you understand the foundation of the United States, it is founded on the doctrine of discovery. A 1453 law that basically gave Europeans, particularly the Portuguese, Spanish, and then out through to all the other Europeans, the right to go to any part of the world where people were not Christian, where natives were brown skinned, and to take over that land and to enslave the people into perpetuity. Till today, the existence of the United States is premised on this law of discovery. It is premised on taking land from native peoples and non-Christian peoples on the basis that they have no right to control that land, but that land must be controlled by the West. And the West has got the preemption right as to how the resources, the land, or anything from that land can be sold, including the, letter, uh, the labor of the people. So we look at that law, that discovery law of 1454, as the premise upon which Zimbabwe became a threat to the United States and other Western powers in that the Zimbabwean people had decided to reverse the discovery uh, doctrine by giving native peoples access and control of their resources or restitution to that which was taken during colonialism. And so we believe that the ability of our people to control their land and their resources threatens Western rights, threatens Western control and hegemony of Africa, Asia, and even the Americas and Australia and Canada, which continue to be colonized territories in which the native peoples are subjugated. And because of Zimbabwe being a threat to the United States by taking back what belongs to Zimbabweans, they evoked a weapon that is being used, an economic weapon that is called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Now, what the International Emergency Economic Powers Act does is instead of making the sanctions targeted at the initial number of 58 people that were put on the initial list of sanctions that were called executive orders 13288, they then also, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, it then also makes sure that it actually targets the entire nation because that nation that has been deemed as a threat to the United States must be neutralized by a weapon. And in this case, the weapon is the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. This act blockades payments to a country that has been seen as a threat to the United States. It makes sure that there is no passing of technology, no passing of machinery, no passing of any goods or services manufactured in the United States. And it also prohibits any assistance to this threat. Now, the reason I'm making this very clear is that the United States is very deceptive in this implementation of these sanctions. The executive orders that initially started in 2001 described and outlined the special designated nationals or people that were supposedly targeted. But the moment that this happens with those executive orders that automatically come with the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act then supersedes this list of people to actually target the people and the government upon which the national emergency has been called. So while you are looking at the targeted individuals who started off as 58, then in 2005, they were increased to 86 through another emergency, uh, through another executive orders that was 13391, and then in 2008, they then increased them and put another third executive order that was now to become 13, uh, uh, four, six, two, six, nine. That in itself meant that the numbers of people kept increasing. But at the end of the day, the, exec the International Emergency Econ Economic Powers Act supersedes these targets, supersedes these names to actually have a blanket sanction on the entire nation, the entire government, its local governments, all parastatals, and any companies owned by the government of Zimbabwe. So it is this arbitrary nature of the sanctions that are deceptive to seem like they're targeted on individuals, yet their collective punishment of civilians, why we formed the organization to start fighting them. But more critically, even if 
the sanctions were targeted on the 120 on the 141 people that are said to be targeted now a lot of those people that are being targeted have never been tried in any court so they are charged for having violated human rights then they were never charged they were never taken into any court they were never tried and given an opportunity to defend themselves so in essence they are people who are being punished without trial so it's basically extrajudicial punishment which is a contravention of the bill of human rights or the universal bill of human rights of laws that were created by the united states itself when it created the united nations and 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 um sorry about that um i, I had a phone call coming in can you hear me hello yes yes we can hear you okay so 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 what we're saying is even if the targeted sanctions were supposedly targeted as long as the individuals who are being punished by sanctions by being having their properties taken being deprived from undertaking international trade from traveling internationally and having their bank accounts blocked those people themselves as long as they've never been tried in any court as long as they've never been tried by any existing law and as long as they've never been tried by a court competent to actually charge them they cannot be punished by sanctions and any punishment by sanctions is extrajudicial punishment it's like slavery where the master simply said the slave is wrong whipped him without any real convention or without any real code to determine the punishment so that already says that the targeted sanctions themselves are illegal and then when we go to the sanctions that are blanket on the government which delivers services to civilians that is a deprivation of civilians from the enjoyment of their human rights and that collective punishment of civilians is illegal at international law it's a contravention of human rights it's persecution of civilians and to certain extent we might actually say it's a crime against humanity upon civilians who are denied water healthcare education uh jobs economic development and all the rights that are enshrined within the human rights uh, uh declara- uh, human rights uh, declaration and other human rights laws and treaties that the united states is signatory to so because of understanding this as an organization we decided that zimbabwe had been under sanctions for 18 years when we were formed and in those 18 years there had been no real challenge to the sanctions other than rhetoric and where it was challenged legally by people like obi there was a removal of sanctions on the health uh, a budget of uh, the uh, global health fund that it stopped giving zimbabwe money so it took people like obi in 2006 to actually challenge the united states to actually challenge the global fund and other health institutions to release funds to zimbabwe and they did it successfully we then wanted to take it from where obi and other uh civil society organizations that left it in releasing our health funds from the global fund to taking this issue now into a legal issue we decided to depoliticize it and we said let's make this a legal fight let's make this fight an equal playing field by taking it to the international law and taking it to the human rights law arena so that we can begin to challenge the existence of these sanctions utilizing existing laws so we went and referred to a resolution that exists in the UN Human Rights Council that is called resolution 3413 the resolution 3413 was created in 2017 was a means by the UN Human Rights Commission to actually create a framework to illegalize the use of unilateral sanctions and to actually begin to seek reparations restitution and damages from sanction senders by nations that are suffering under sanctions the same resolution also stipulates that countries that are under sanctions must mitigate those sanctions must not cooperate with sanctions and those countries that are not under sanctions or third party countries are actually enjoined to avoid implementing illegal sanctions so what we saw started to do is we started to look at who is imposing sanctions on Zimbabwe and who's implementing the sanctions how is the united states the europeans and the uk implementing these sanctions and we realized that they implement them through financial institutions financial institutions that are american financial institutions that are non american that over comply by implementing these sanctions so the very first action that we took is in south african courts 
where we have gone to sue all South African banks and US banks that are operating from South Africa, which is the biggest trading partner of Zimbabwe. We're taking them through the courts to actually challenge the implementation of these illegal sanctions. And now we've got a basis upon which to call these sanctions illegal in that the special rapporteur of the UN Human Rights Council who measures the negative impact uh, of sanctions actually came to Zimbabwe to measure the impact of these sanctions. After she measured the impact of these sanctions, she issued a preliminary report that declared the sanctions illegal and that declared the implementation and enforcement or compliance to these sanctions illegal too. So that gave us a basis for us to start the legal challenge on these san- of these sanctions in South African courts. We would take it to the African court and eventually we would like to make sure that we've got enough precedents to take it to the International Court of Justice. But one thing we've decided to do is to say that many Africans complain that international laws do not favor Africans, but they favor Europeans. We have decided to say you cannot expect law to affect you or to benefit you if you do not create the precedence that favors you. So part of the reason why we as Africans, why we as Zimbabweans on behalf of Africa are now challenging these sanctions in African courts is to begin to create the case law, is to begin to create the theory and practice or custom for Africans fighting for their rights, particularly against illegal sanctions within African courts to give African courts the say, the power to make the law and to actually start setting the custom and precedents that can be used in future. We then will go to the African court. Again, we intend to pull the United States and their institutions through African institutions to give our African institutions gravitas, to give our African institutions a say in how international law is being created. So by the time we leave Africa to go to the International Court of Justice, we are actually going to have precedence and custom that has been set by African courts through which we're going to now enforce in the International Court of Justice to create case law or to create custom that favors Africans. The Iranians taught us to do this. They took the United States to the International Court of Justice after they were already under UN sanctions for infringing the uh, atomic, uh, atomic or, uh, for atomic or nuclear proliferation. But even though they were under UN sanctions, the Iranians went to the International Court of Justice, challenged American sanctions that were imposed together with UN sanctions unilaterally, and they won. There's currently dispute as to challenges to that uh, or review to that particular International Court of Justice ruling of 2018, but the Iranians have already set a precedence that it can be done. So I just want to close this by saying that uh, the impact of the sanctions on Zimbabwe has been that the collective sanctions on the Zimbabwean people, which are both from the congressional sanctions together with the executive order sanctions, has been the denial of Zimbabwean government of funds, and the denial of the Zimbabwean government of loans, the denial of Zimbabwean government of assistance and aid in order to give the Zimbabwean people all that they need socially and economically to develop the country. And this is particularly heinous when you understand that the Zimbabwean government took over a country that had been under colonialism for 90 years. Africans were basically deprived of all basic rights in contravention of the League of Nations uh, chapter 11 and in contravention of the UN Charter. But still the British did not give the Zimbabwean people basic human rights. And when our government came in to undertake the role of giving black people and giving all Zimbabweans the basic human rights denied by colonialism, we then had the sanctions that were imposed on us. And to some extent, some might say Zimbabwe has been under sanctions since the colonialism began. But more importantly, even when the colonialism ended, we had the UN sanctions that were on the Rhodesian government for 14 years being imputed on the Zimbabwean people because we now had to develop our industry from the underdevelopment. We now had to develop the infrastructure that wasn't developed while under UN sanctions during colonialism. And when we got independence, we did not get reparations. We did not get uh, the, 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 the tools to develop our country or to lift it from the underdevelopment of the 14 years of UN sanctions that were imposed on a colonizer, but inherited by our country. Instead, we were forced to take over the colonial debt of the colonial government, 
which is part and parcel of why the Zimbabwean government owes a lot of money to multilateral institutions because it's it's colonial debt and a lack of payment of reparations. So now, as we fight these sanctions, part and parcel of our objective is to convince other Africans to join us in this action because we need to make sure that we make a statement that sanctions cannot continue to be used on African countries. And if indeed the West continue to use these sanctions on African countries, there should be repercussions in that we shall demand reparations for these crimes against humanity, for this persecution, and for this underdevelopment that is caused by sanctions. We shall also ask for damages And we shall also approach, like now, we are part and parcel of our agenda, is to approach American companies, European companies, and British companies that have been denied access into Zimbabwe by these U.S., illegal U.S., EU, and U.K. sanctions that have denied them access into a country by illegal sanctions. So all the mining companies in America have lost out to the Chinese, lost out to the Russians because of their own government prohibiting them through the International Emergency Economic Powers Act from investing in Zimbabwe by implementation of illegal sanctions. Those losses, those financial losses by American companies, those financial losses by European companies, those financial losses by British companies should actually be penalties upon the the, 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 the American government, European governments, and UK governments for denying people access into Zimbabwe, which is very contrary contrary to free market economics. And that's why we want to convince- Rotendo, Rotendo, let me me just interject really quick here because we want to make sure that we allow time for the rest of our our, our panelists to to go. Thank you very much. And we'll be able, and you'll be able to get more out in, in the conversation. Uh, I, I wanted to make just a slight little change here, uh, and I wanted to uh, uh, add Simon come on, uh, and 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 I didn't do something that I should have done at the beginning of this is give everybody a time a time, <laughs> a, time a time limit. So I, I hate to do it now, but I really want us to get into a a, a, a robust discussion. And so if we can go like you know, give ten to fifteen minutes. Uh, uh, you know, moving forward, you don't have to take the whole 10 or the whole 15 because we really want to get into a discussion. So we'll go with Simon and then we'll go with our, our friends and colleagues and comrades with the uh, Eritrean Embassy. And then we will go with our friends and, and colleagues and comrades at the uh, Cuban Embassy now. So Simon will go and then we'll move uh, to Ambassador Solomon and then we'll move there. Thank you very much. Uh. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, I, I actually, um, I know that uh, our, our ambassador, esteemed ambassador, um, uh, Barhane Solomon, he's very, very busy. If it's okay, um, and uh, also the other embassy staff at this very, very crazy time, <laughs> uh, maybe they can go before me, um, if, if that's okay. No, that is absolutely mind. no. That is absolutely wonderful and gracious of you. So uh, we will, we will, uh, uh, Ambassador Solomon, if you wanted to uh, step right in, or if Ambassador uh, Rivera, if you wanted to step in, I'll just out. Ambassador Rivera, you wanted to go. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity of participating in this uh, a webinar to to share some views on the on the economic and. Uh, financial and commercial blockade against Cuba, which is the central uh, axis of the uh, US government's policy towards uh, Cuba. Our country has lived for 60 years under the siege of this uh, complex mechanism of sanctions, intensified at times uh, of greatest uh, vulnerability for the Cuban people. If we go to the history of the sanctions, Although the blockade against Cuba was officially decreed in 1962, its application dates back to the very moment of the, uh, of the revolution in 1959, and has been a permanent tool in the policy of, uh, so of the different U.S. administration towards Cuba. But on February, February 1962, then President John F. Kennedy declared the unilateral blockade against Cuba through the Foreign Aid Act of 1961. The objective at that time and today was and is clear to suffocate the nation economically and starve, starve the Cuban people, lacking the resources uh, prohibited 
by Washington's policy towards the Cuban uh, government. In 1992, the Torricelli Act made the, the blockade an extraterritorial matter by sanctioning third nations because the law, that law prohibits US uh, subsidiaries in third countries from trading good, goods with Cuba. Subsequently, the Hans Burton Act uh, in 1996 intensified and further reinforced that hostile uh, policy against the Cuban people and codified the blockade uh, by removing executive power to the White House for controlling and enacting the foreign policy on Cuba. We, we, if we come to the recent times, during we could say that during the, the Donald Trump's uh, uh, administration, 243 unilateral coercive uh, measures were applied against Cuba, which stood out for their system, systematicity, systematicity and intentionality. In the course of the Biden administration, this system of unilateral coercive measures had remained almost intact with severe effects on national efforts to contain the pandemic and alleviate the economic and social consequences that came from it. A few days ago, as you probably heard, the White House announced some measures making small changes to the sanctions against our country. This decision have limited impact in the enforcement of the blockade, but they are a move in the right uh, direction. We could say that at current prices, the accumulated uh, damage in six days of application of this policy amounted to 147,853.3 million US dollars. Taking into account the depreciation of the dollar against the value of gold in the international market, the blockade has caused uh, damages of more than 1 trillion 377 million 998 thousand dollars. The blockade in our case includes a set of measures of aggression and economic coercion with the declared intention of isolating, suffocating and immobilizing Cuba and created unrest in the Cuban uh, population. It imposes restriction on imports and exports to and from Cuba, as well as on traveling, remittances, commerce with third countries, telecommunication, finances, finance, banking, among others. The impact of all these sectors is uh, enormous, as well as on others which are essential in society, so, such as healthcare, education, transportation, tourism, and, and agriculture. Non sectors of the Cuban economy, neither aspects of our life escape from, escape from the damage of the, the blockade. The blockade, for example, prevents Cuba from accessing to faster and more expeditious transportation logistic routes, which forces, in our case, the transfer of supply through several countries at a high additional cost. There is a growing refusal, a refusal of financial and banking institutions in various countries to process op uh, operation with Cuba, which has prevented timely financial transactions with suppliers uh, of uh, purchases inputs. During the, the pandemic, for instance, Cuba had to resort to other suppliers as intermediaries for obtaining uh, medical components, which meant a, prior, a price increase that ranged from uh, between 50 and 65% of the historical uh, established price, given the impossibility of contracting directly with the manufacturer. The sanctions, in our case, have consequences that cannot be uh, quantified, such as unsatisfied needs, limited family ties, obstacle to academic, scientific, and cultural exchanges. This measure reduces the quality of life or the, and the possibility of uh, full enjoyment of rights. This reaches all Cuban citizens without discrimination of sex, age, of, uh, or race. It affects the daily life of everyone, everyone, women included. We all face a great obstacle for national production of food and the acquisition of it. Companies in charge of manufacturing food products, for example, in the country, have to import uh, almost 70% of the raw material from different markets, but, they, but not from the, from the US. 
However, today the blockade has made it impossible to make those purchases in the US market, which is very attractive uh, because we are uh, neighbors. If we go to, uh, to the implication on other institutions, for example, the development of uh, culture in all its forms is a priority for the Cuban state. However, these sectors continue to be one of the most affected by the application of the US uh, blockade against Cuba. Social development, education, technology, and art are all strongly impacted by the sanctions, taking into account that we confront difficulties in inserting ourselves into international trade with current uh, and potential uh, mark, uh, partners, carry out financial operation and acquire basic supply for those for these sectors. The effects on the blockade on the health uh, sector only in 2020 amount to 198 million, uh, more than that uh, dollars, which reflects the, the magnitude of the impact of this policy. For example, in the context of the, pandi of the pandemic, the blockade has been a significant obstacle to, uh, to face the, the economic and health consequences of the disease. More, more than 30 products and supply that are urgently uh, required for the protocols prevention and treatment of COVID-19 were unable to be purchased because of the blockade. We have uh, several exa examples that uh, we can share with you if you are uh, interested. Uh, in conclusions, when you add up all this that I have uh, mentioned before, uh, you can conclude that the blockade is the main obstacle to advancing in, to, uh, to advance in, in the search of, uh, for the prosperity and well-being of the Cuban uh, population. And this is my bottom line. To ignore its uh, existence would not be only uh, to be untrue, but also to insult a people that has known no other paradigm of development that uh, that mark by the most uh, genocidal uh, blockade applies against any country. The international community, as you might know, uh, each year votes against the, the blockade and Cuba really appreciate that uh, critical uh, support. Thank you so much for, for having me today in this uh, webinar. And, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you. And, um, you know, just to, just to move along, uh, Ambassador Solomon, by all means. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the organizers, uh, co-sponsors, and also Obi for keeping us uh, connected. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, also thank my colleagues who shared their experience on, on the sanctions. Well, for, for us, Eritrean sanctions uh, has been there for us since the inception of our nation. Uh, there's nothing good can come from sanctions as, we, as our experience tells us. Uh, sanctions are always uh, entitled by the rich and powerful countries, uh, Spanish uh, developing or poor countries, they use a very deceptive uh, mechanism of lies uh, to make uh, their sanctions appealing to others. And it's also illegal. I mean, countries who, who want to police uh, other countries uh, are using sanction, sanctions without any legal, legal uh, premises. Uh, and also sanctions always uh, are pro provocative and uh, make people react uh, and also make uh, countries and regions volatile. Uh, and I can say sanctions are always an anti-peace, source of po poverty and a means of betrayal. Uh, and after all, nothing will come from sanctions. Sanctions are always useless. Uh, for the people of the world, but sanctions are the best tools for those who want to punish others. So uh, for us, it's always that we have to fight sanctions and, 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 and stop that, the, the notion that 
all powerful nations can punish others by sanctions. Uh, as, as I speak, as we speak today, uh, Eritrea is under unilateral sanctions uh, by the United States. The Eritrean Defense Forces, all the parastatal uh, economic uh, development companies of Eritrea uh, who operate under uh, trust ship fund to develop the, the economy uh, and important officials of the country are under sanctions. We believe unilateral sanctions are illegal uh, because no one should sanction the other based on their own interests uh, without considering uh, engagement and, and partnership. Uh, so the, for Eritrea, the first time that sanctions were applied is during decolonization. Eritrea was under the Italian colony for about uh, 51 years. The Italians were defeated during the Second World War in 1941 uh, in Eritrea by the British. And the British uh, then promised Eritrea, once the Italians are defeated, Eritrea would be an independent nation. Uh, by using a transition period of 10 years to uh, administer Eritrea, then uh, the, the British dishonored their promise. And at that time, uh, the involvement of the United States uh, at the end of the World War was very significant. Uh, and uh, American team, a team of American uh, military uh, communication experts visited Eritrea at that time when the British uh, were administered in Eritrea. And they, they tested uh, uh, the, the the geographical location of Eritrea, uh, if they can use it for uh, communication interception. So people might wonder why the United States was against Eritrean independence and why the United States and uh, the European countries were against uh, Eritrean liberation uh, because, uh, uh, because of the geopolitical interests, but also particularly uh, be, from the experience of the Italian naval station that was stationed in Asmara, they, they thought uh, during that time, in the absence of satellites, the, the, the positioning of their communications in Asmara, in the capital city of Asmara, uh, Eritrea, uh, was very significant. And uh, uh, the, the team tested that in 1943, April 1943, and they were uh, successful in their, in their tests, and they believe that they have to have a, a long-term interest in Eritrea. Uh, and I don't know why they, they were not considering Eritrea an independent state cooperating with them. They, they because of their hegemonic uh, thinking, uh, they said they have to gain support of the king in Ethiopia and, and then annex Eritrea with Ethiopia so that they can uh, use it for their own benefits. Uh, that's why they established the Kanyo, Kanyo station, a very well-known uh, eavesdropping uh, spy station for the Americans then. Uh, there's a good example of that uh, successful uh, communication interception that they were doing. Uh, in October 1943, uh, the German uh, armed forces, the Wehrmacht, they, they uh, in, invited the uh, Japanese ambassador uh, in, in Germany to visit the, their front lines. Uh, and then the, the visit was reported back to Tokyo. Uh, all the details that were reported to Tokyo were intercepted from the station in Asmara and, and was presented to Eisenhower uh, to make the Normandy uh, deployment decisions that, that ended the Second World War. So from that time, the United States sees Eritrea uh, an important uh, geographical, geopolitical place, but always sees it from the interest of uh, its Ethiopian uh, diplomatic connections and uh, security interests. So Eritrea was uh, supposed to be decolonized and independent in 1941. 
But then the British promised that they were going to administer Eritrea for 10 years, and Eritrea was supposed to uh, be liberated or free by 1951. In 1951, the United States, the British, and the Ethiopian king, is, king conspired, agreed that uh, Eritrea remains under Ethiopian uh, occupation or annexed to Ethiopia. Uh, there is a famous, uh, a famous uh, saying by uh, statement by John Foster Dallas that he said in 1951, from the point of justice, the opinion of the Eritrean people for independence must receive consideration. Nevertheless, the strategic interests of the United States in the Red Sea Basin and considerations of security and the world peace make it necessary that the country of Eritrea has to be linked with our ally, Ethiopia. This is the beginning of the United States sanctioning Eritrean independence from uh, the beginning. Uh, we have sanctions today, but the same sanctions were there in 1951 whether the sanctions are uh, formal or informal. So Eritreans had to, to, to pay a heavy price to get the, the, the independence. We paid a very heavy price. We have paid about 65,000 young people to liberate Eritrea. And Eritrea was liberated in 1991 in defense of all the odds. No Western country was uh, willing to accept Eritrea as a, as, as a free nation, but Eritreans uh, did it. So we had a brief period of uh, peace with Ethiopia from 1991 to 1998. Th then it was the only time that the United States and Western countries were not hostile. They were not supportive, but they were not also hostile against Eritrea. We didn't feel any kind of sanctions during those seven years. In 1998, the TPLF-led uh, government in Ethiopia invaded Eritrea. Within no time, the United States and the Europeans sided with, with Ethiopia. And they started uh, supporting them by all means to defeat Eritrea. They, their dream was to bring back Eritrea into Ethiopia, to annex again Eritrea. Uh, that we had to fight it hard. Again, we, we, we had to pay about 20,000 young people to defend our, our uh, independence. Uh, the war ended in 2000. We had to go to the uh, Eritrea Ethiopia Boundary Commission in the Hague. Uh, the commission had to make decisions on the boundaries that uh, were taken as a pretext for the war. Uh, then in 2002, in April, the verdict came and Eritrea accepted the verdict. Ethiopia rejected it. The irony, the, the Western powers promised that during the signing of the agreement, anyone who rejects the agreement had to be punished depending on the United Nations Charter, Charter 7. When we, Ethiopia rejected, not only they didn't punish Ethiopia, they supported Ethiopia against Eritrea. And they sanctioned Eritrea uh, using pretext of uh, uh, involvement of Eritrea in Somalia, which never existed, which the uh, Eritrea Somalia Monetary Group said didn't find any evidence. But because the jury, the judge, and the accuser are the same, then they had to pass. Uh, a resolution uh, condemning Eritrea, sanctioning Eritrea. Eritrea had to stay under sanction from 2019 until 2018. A change came in Ethiopia, a uh, new, new government in Ethiopia, and it had accepted the EEBC decision, and Eritrea and Ethiopia uh, signed the peace and friendship agreement. We made peace. Uh, the, the agreement was signed on Sunday, and uh, United Nations uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres visited Ethiopia on Monday and met the new prime minister. That day, Secretary General Guterres declared that the sanctions against Israel must be lifted because the two countries have made peace. So they told us we were sanctioned just because we had a problem with Ethiopia, because 
we were in conflict with Ethiopia. So uh, we knew it was unjust, but the, the, the Secretary General revealed that the sanctions were meaningful support to Ethiopia, but while the two countries are in good terms, sanctions are not needed. And then in, in, in November 2018, the sanctions were uh, lifted. So uh, we live under sanctions from, from the beginning now. It, it, it has now gone about 81 years, starting from 1941 up to now. So we live in defense, we fight it, we don't cooperate with sanctions, uh, and we don't accept it. And we, we, we are enduring, we are prevailing. Uh, every time they, they put sanctions against us, we have to fight. But with, with consequence, as, as the theme of this uh, forum uh, detailed it, there are consequences, consequences economic consequences. We, we uh, have been denied to develop our economy. Uh, we had to pay heavy price. There is a, a heavy human toll that, that we, we, we lose because of these sanctions and the sanctions provoked conflicts that, that they are instilling in our, in our region, uh, in our neighborhood. So uh, uh, the British in 1950, to, to prove that uh, Eritrea is incapable of being a nation, they destroyed all the infrastructure. So the sanctions followed by destruction of Eritrea's 50 years built infrastructure to make it uh, incapable of uh, being a nation. Uh, recently, uh, in the 2009 sanctions, European countries like Germany uh, were involved in, in financing uh, gold mining in, in Eritrea as we, did, we develop our, our mines. Uh, because of the sanctions, they had to, to pull out. JP Morgan with, withdrew from the potash, Kolili potash project, which, is, which has a prospect of 200 years and one of the best potash sites in, in the world. Uh, we were unable to buy even uh, uh, development materials, spare parts, uh, fishing boats, uh, airplanes, Everything was uh, under sanctions and we had to live, fight and endure all, all these sanctions, but with all with consequence of putting our economy still backwards. Uh, the other thing that the sanctions made uh, damage is that uh, the, the TPLF led uh, movement and its ideology in, in, in the Horn of Africa was emboldened by the sanctions uh, that they put against us. You all remember November 2020, the TPLF launched a new war against its own army, against its own government, um, in, in contrary to the constitution that the TPLF itself wrote and, and uh, uh, ratified. The West decided to side with the TPLF and didn't engage the Ethiopian and Eritrean governments in, on how to solve the, the, the the current conflict. So uh, in last, uh, last year in, in September, President Biden made an ex executive order uh, trying to put uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia under, under sanctions. Uh, the war is happening in Ethiopia. Eritrea was involved only when it was attacked by the TPLF, by the missile launch made by the TPLF. Uh, but the executive order was also implemented, not uh, in Ethiopia, but also against Eritrea. They, they, they decided last November that the Eritrean Defense Forces, all the parastatal companies, uh, development companies in Eritrea, and all important individual officials who, who, who have nothing to do with, with the war that had happened in, in Ethiopia, and they, they, they defamed the Eritrean army for make, uh, committing atrocities and trying to sanction Eritrea. So everything they are doing is to destroy Eritrea. And this is not uh, uh, happening only for Eritrea, but many countries, as we have been hearing from our colleagues and other, other countries throughout the, the world. 
So what, what, what is the prospect of sanctions in the future? What can we do? For Eritreans, this is part of our life to fight against sanctions and endure and live uh, uh, in liberty from all the hegemonic uh, attempts made against us. The only thing uh, to fight sanctions is that we have to say no more, which Simon, I think, is going to speak about that. We have to say no more for the hegemony, no more for, 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 for the sanctions, and try to work in unison. All like-minded people, like-minded countries, like-minded organizations and individuals have to come together and defeat the, the, the idea of sanctions that uh, the powerful uh, countries are using to punish uh, developing countries and, and people like Eritrea. Thank you so much. Thank you, and, and, and a nice, seg nice seg segue, segue to Simon. To Simon. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you um, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event today. And uh, I want to thank you for all the esteemed colleagues, uh, uh, esteemed officials, dignitaries who gave their statements are fighting the good fight, defending, um, you know, these countries that are under attack, fighting imperialism. And so um, to be on today with them is it's really an honor. Um, if you don't mind, I have just uh, Ambassador uh, Berhane Solomon, he just actually gave a lot of stuff that I was going to say. Um, I was going to do a little bit on Eritrea and then move into like this no more movement that has evolved as this pan-African movement to defend against san uh, sanctions, a global movement really. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm just gonna just maybe share my screen or should I just talk? Uh, <laughs> I have we, a presentation. We, if, uh, we can try, let's see. Uh, let's try. It, it's no big deal. Okay, we are. You, just, just go ahead and talk, okay, okay. All right, so uh, I'll spare everyone the, um, the details of the air train, the historic air train struggle. Um, uh, what I will say is that uh, actually, as Ambassador Burhane just mentioned, um, you know, since day one, sanctions were a part of life in Eritrea. And, uh, you know, I want to reiterate that in 1997, Eritrea had 8% uh, growth was one of the fastest growing countries um, in the world at that time. And, um, and really, and this was back, this is 1997. And unsurprisingly, uh, Eritrea was plunged into war by TPLF, uh, which led the Ethiopian people astray, um, uh, you know, and basically, um, you know, served as the attack dog in the region. And, um, Basically, it came down to Eritrea and Ethiopia, uh, you know, as who is going to lead the destinies of the people of the Horn of Africa, um, you know, one representing the peoples of the Horn, the other one representing external forces. And so um, it was clear that Eritrea was um, a model that had to be put down. Um, we can talk about uh, Eritrea's mining uh, sector um, you know, uh, that was just recent, you know, just mentioned now. Um, it was clear that the Eritrean mining sector was a target of the, um, of the sanctions. And in fact, when the first round of sanctions were passed in 2009, UN sanctions, that is, uh, the, um, there was a follow up sanctions in 2011 when they realized just how advanced the Eritrean mining sector had become and how it had presented a new model for Africa in terms of um, the share of the profits that a country, that African country will be getting in, in terms of mining. When they realized this, they said, okay, we've got to put down this model. Actually, I had, uh, citing, I had cited for you here, uh, a WikiLeak from the US ambassador at the time. Um, this was back in 2006. Um, when, um, and in this WikiLeak, you have the ambassador saying, Basically, the quote, third, when he's, he's actually listing out the problems with uh, the Eritrean mining sector, he says, third, the potential under the existing law for the 
government of the state of Eritrea to have nearly 30% ownership in a mining extraction company is inconsistent with the 10% ownership that has become the standard of other parts of Africa. So clearly he's pointing out the fact that Eritrea was creating a, a model of uh, you know, shared profits with these companies that come into the country where actually it's not just 30%, it's, it's actually 40%. And when you add in royalties, you're talking about 60, 70%, um, you know, of profits coming, uh, uh, coming to Eritrea, the people of Eritrea. And you saw this replicated in other countries. Tanzania is another one that we can talk about. And um, people began to take notice. So Eritrea became a target of sanctions and specifically the mining companies because this was essentially a way of, you know, um, if you don't have oil or you don't have, you know, there's, there's something that's going to bring those dollars to the country. And they just specifically targeted that. Now it's evolved to, to potash mining and other sorts of things, but still, you know, still in the mining sector. Um, so um, what I'm trying to say is uh, I, I could go on actually about Eritrea, but I think we've come to a point where um, I think, you know, um, talking about more of what the response is by the people of Eritrea, the people of the Horn of Africa, people of Africa in regards to sanctions at the current moment. So as I said, you know, the sanctions were implemented against Eritrea, uh, 2009, new round of them in 2011, targeting the mining sector. Uh, so these were repealed in 2018. And I want everybody to think about this for one second, UN sanctions. You know, give me an instance where um, UN sanctions, multilateral sanctions, have been removed against the country with zero concessions. Nothing was given up. But what did Eritrea give up in order to get the sanctions repealed? So the question is, how did that happen? Um, if we go back to 2010, immediately after the sanctions uh, happened at the end of 2009, this is about February, February 22nd, uh, 2010, Eritreans around the world got together um, and had these global demonstrations uh, against the UN. And all this stuff was documented on the, uh, the eSmart website, which is, um, I had a screenshot of it, but basically it was this anti-sanctions movement within the Eritrean community, global community um, to fight these sanctions. And, it's part of this older tradition that goes back to the 30 year air trend struggle in which the people come together and they engage in what was known as Kuzbawi Mahate, which means um, popular resistance. There's not an exact translation, but popular rebuff, popular resistance of the people. Um, so everywhere around the world, if you're an air trend, you go to your local community, there's this kind of like a resistance committee kind of thing. It just naturally, it's part of the infrastructure of struggle um, that was created over 30 years. And everywhere you go around the world, there's these groups. And what they did is they, um, whenever the home country is under attack, we mobilize. And, um, and so, you know, there were these global demonstrations that happened, which then led to event, you know, consistently challenging them at every single corner while, the back home government, people, military are doing what they need to do in order to change the geopolitics of the region, defend the country. And so um, what happened was um, political changes happened in Ethiopia, which by the way, was predicted by President Isayas um, in the 90s, uh, actually it was recorded by Robert, Ka uh, 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 Robert Kaplan, um, when he was talking in um, uh, Surrender or Starve, in which he talks about the, um, basically says that Oromos will continue to ask for power because TPLF is essentially greedy with its power and you know, you're making all the resources go to themselves, enriching themselves, and eventually they're going to flip out, you know, the government's going to fall. So that happened, and that happened in 2018. And the historic pictures of you know, an Oromo prime minister who had come to power, shaking hands with President Isayas. Um, that was, by the way, Prime Minister Abiy in Ethiopia and President Isayas in Eritrea. Um, when that happened, a few, that was um, in the summer of 
the 2018. A few months later, that fall, Eritrea was able to remove the sanctions. Uh, Abiy re received the Nobel Peace Prize, which is odd that President Isias didn't also get the peace prize because usually when you have a peace between two countries, it's the two leaders that get the peace. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Eritrea is the target and they couldn't have that type of positive PR. So, of course, um, they gave it to um, Prime Minister Abiy. But you know what? At the end of the day, uh, I don't think anyone should be proud about getting a Nobel Peace Prize given the history of, the, uh, of that uh, institution. But anyway, um, what we do know, though, is that the sanctions were repealed. Um, Erichin's had a history of struggle and resistance and infrastructure that had already existed um, for all these years, fighting and fighting and fighting, going back to the struggle. Um, and it was from the people. So that being said, um, when TPLF, uh, which Ambassador Burhan had just mentioned earlier, this ethnic uh, type of um, the term that's used nowadays uh, by um, uh, Elias Amari, one of our esteemed comrades, um, is a ethno-fascist. In throughout, uh, actually in, in Ethiopia, um, you have this issue of tribalism, very, very serious issue throughout Africa. It, it is a, in my opinion, it is a, a cancer. Um, tribalism, as Fanon said, is essentially stupid. Um, and what, what it does is it, um, you know, people, are fighting, you know, for this narrow-minded, backwards tendency that, um, you know, when it becomes militarized and politicized, uh, it can lead to great war and struggle throughout Africa, and it's very divisive. And so, um, TPLF, um, you know, attacked <clears throat> um, Ethiopia and Eritrea in November 2020, and what ended up happening was that um, they. Uh, they, they, um, the Eritrean people, the Ethiopian people, now at peace, now wanting to, you know, come together, you know, uh, work together economically, socially, politically. Um, now they were plunged into war, and um, they were immediately defeated within a less than about three weeks' time. And um, what you know, and then what happened was, and when Biden, when the Biden administration came to office in January, they basically provided all kinds of support for TPLF um, and uh, very openly, very brazenly, and then started instituting sanctions against Eritrea and Ethiopia, um, you know, and um, they actually instituted a, an executive order. The interesting thing that I want everybody to pay attention to this executive order that was passed, um, I believe it was in September, um, around that time last year, was it actually draws on not the Magnits Magnitsky Act, but instead draws on um, local immigration laws of the United States. Why? As I said, the history of the Eritrean struggle is the people abroad are very much connected to the people at home. And what this leads to is this you know, connected struggle where you just can't bully the nation back there without getting some type of resistance here in the States. And so um, the Ethiopians and the Eritreans, and I have images uh, prior to um, what happened in November, Eritreans and Ethiopians started to work together. And as I mentioned, the Eritreans had a, this infrastructure of struggle and resistance in the diaspora. Ethiopians were de developing these things as well too, but it, it was this kind of these newer structures um, and it was, you know, disparate groups that were doing this, but they started to coalesce with the Eritreans who had that infrastructure that, of struggle already in place. So um, what then happened is seeing this and seeing the resistance that it was causing, this executive order was not targeting the diaspora, you know, the people abroad, the people here in the States who are defending their motherlands. Um, and the way I've described this is sort of what I like to call the golden trinity where you have um, the diaspora, one, the government back home, and then the local population at home as well too, all working together. This is a unique situation, it's not common, um, but I think it is something that could work for Africa. If, if, you know, if we can get these governments that, can, you know, that are fighting the good fight, you know, resisting imperialism, 
So it was a unique situation last year where Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia were, kind, were in the same boat, had a tripartite alliance. Um, and we can talk about this more some other time, but basically three governments that were coming together, meaning also the diasporas were coming together. And, um, and, and so this, they, you know, they started to see this and started to get concerned in Washington. And how effective was it? Let's just say it was so effective that it literally removed a Virginia governor for um, just as a just as a, a an expression of anger. The day we started uh, the campaign, we started this uh, campaign called "No More" to um, say "No More" to imperialism. Essentially, uh, it's an anti-exploitation movement, but it was out of a year of frustration, a year of um, the um, of war by TPLF backed by the U.S. and um, and so seeing this backing by the U.S. and the unbelievable levels of disinformation, deception, uh, division, uh, you know, militaristic push, you know, in the Horn of Africa, just outright, just like in your face to the, to the point where there was a, a U.S. general um, or colonel, I believe it was, who was in Djibouti saying we're based, uh, we're going to um, take actions in Ethiopia. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and they use the pretext of like to save their embassy members, basically threatening invasion of Ethiopia. And seeing that, the unbelievable levels of, of disinformation by CNN, people on the streets of Addis Ababa, remember domestic population, uh, the streets of Addis Ababa are holding signs saying no more, that led to people in the diaspora saying signs of no more, government officials saying no more. So that, that, that golden triangle that I was talking about, everyone was moving on the same accord. And this is a very potent, very, very potent force. And if I could really say what was very special about the Eritrean revolution, this was a major factor. Eritrea, um, um, we don't know the exact numbers of the size of the Eritrean uh, diaspora population, but Somewhere in the ballpark of uh, 1.5 million is estimated uh, uh, to a domestic population of about four to five million. Um, this is uh, actually it was 1.5 to three million at the time of um, right after independence. So that is a significant level of the diaspora uh, or the population, which are Eritrean citizens that are living outside relative to at home. So what that means is that. Um, you know, you have this very special role that the diaspora plays. So um, it's not the same exactly in other parts of Africa, but specifically for Eritrea, which makes it a good anchor in terms of diaspora activism and other African groups rallying around the Eritrean community, working with the Eritrean community. So this is very much the case with this movement now, this had what had become a movement called the No More Movement, where everyone was saying no more to uh, um, what the U.S. was doing. Um, it didn't really articulate itself perfectly, but it started off just saying, you know, no more dangerous U.S. interventions and, you know, and, and uh, undermining the Ethiopian democracy and this kind of thing. And, you know, for the Ethiopians, Eritreans had their own message. Uh, Somalis, a, a month later, also began to say no more. So now you had three countries that were saying no more against uh, this stuff. And then it became very clear that it was against sanctions. Because what did they start to do? They saw what the Eritreans, Ethiopians, and Somalis were doing. So they started to push two sanctions bills against both. They removed uh, Ethiopia uh, from the African Growth and Development uh, Opportunities Act. Um, and, um, and then they continued to um, just push aggressively these, these bills. And in the language of these bills, if you'll believe it or not, it targets, it says disinformation. And again, it's drawing on, you know, domestic laws to go after these diaspora communities. It says the, the people in the diaspora, it explicitly says people in the diaspora. So, um, and it's a, and another word, they, the word they use is agents of the air training Ethiopian governments. So um, clearly, if you resist sanctions in the US connected to your motherland where you, your family, your people are you're from, um, you know, they're, they're looking at you, they're monitoring you, um, they're seeing what's going on, and now they have this disinformation board, as we just saw, which people have, you know, 
ridiculed as like the ministry of, to, uh, of truth, um, you know, and it had to go away because it was so unpopular, but, you know, for sure it will return. So I think that nowadays people that are challenging sanctions here in the States, uh, around the world, um, particularly in these like Western nations that are the ones pushing these sanctions, um, they're going to be targets and it's no longer, you know, terrorism. They're not going to say terrorism anymore. It's disinformation agents is what they're saying. So um, the people have got to be ready um, to resist this and fight against this and should really start thinking about the role of the diaspora. If you are a country that doesn't have uh, an anti-imperialist diaspora that's connected strongly to the, maybe the governments back home, um, you know, it's um, work together with perhaps these communities that do, um, you know, because we know what they're doing in Latin America, bringing particular types of uh, people here to challenge the governments back over there. They tried to do that to Eritrea, but it's funny when they do that. They come here, they, they come here, and then they eventually, like you know, you see them holding, you know, uh, pictures of President Isaiah Saforki, or you know, uh, you know. So they haven't been as successful with Eritrea um, and Ethiopia, it seems now. But um, uh, I think. We have to, you know, the people of Zimbabwe, the people of Mali, um, a lot of these countries that are being targeted right now have to work together. Cuba, uh, Venezuela, uh, all these uh, countries that are under attack, we have to get together. And I think that this movement of no more, which I wish I could go into it more and show you pictures and stuff like that to explain just how prominent it was. It, it was a hashtag and it just became this, this you know, uh, movement where you know you're getting like four to five thousand tweets per hour and it became sort of this like this um this roving what i like to call a roving digital army of peace whenever a country's under attack they say oh you know we're going to do this i'll give you a perfect example Som somalia they were threatening actions against president Famajo of somalia at a time when um you know or it, it, uh, there was um you wanted to change the prime minister which was legally you know part of their their constitution and um and when they the u.s saw this and didn't like this there was a threat made on twitter by the um the assistant secretary of state for african affairs saying that we're going to quote unquote take actions the very uh or the, right away the entire no more movement mobilized on twitter um and principally at first and you know said you will not stand for this to the point where Somalia was trending worldwide no more was trending worldwide Somalis Eritreans Ethiopians a whole bunch of Somalis changed their background to this hashtag you know it says no more now so um and that right there was such a clear display of um uh you know just how powerful this movement can be because what we saw was the very next day um Blinken had to walk back that statement. And, um, and I actually had a picture for you, but basically where they didn't apologize, but they said that, you know, we're working with President Farmajo now or something like that. So it, it was a demonstration, it was a proof of concept that we could take uh, this massive, that was Eritreans, Ethiopians, rally for Somalia, and the same thing was then done for Mali. And then all these different countries in Africa were saying no more, seeing that it was effective. And when you can mobilize, I'm not joking, millions of people around the world, which is what no more did, because these, 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 uh, these um, we had demonstrations on November 21st, where all around the world in 35 cities, um, particularly in Western capitals was the focus. Um, the, we had these demonstrations where, you know, including, Locally in Addis Ababa, millions of people came out to the streets, millions, and said no more. And so it was, again, this is a proof of concept that you can mobilize, that you can take this huge digital roving army of peace to defend countries. If Cuba's under attack, if Haiti's under attack, if Venezuela, or whatever country is under attack um, on the African continent, off the African continent, um, you know, we can mobilize and defend and support one another because we all have things like hands off Cuba, hands off Zimbabwe, you know, hands off Mali or whatever. But the thing is, is that we're, we're doing this, you know, independently and we have to continue doing that, but we have to coalesce. And in the digital world, which is now where all the, you know, um, where most people get their news now and particularly on Twitter. Um, and so 
to put that under a common hashtag like no more, it's actually kind of using their own strategy. Because if you think about it, um, when I say their own strategy, I'm talking about the strategy of the State Department. Um, the strategy that they've used for a long time is through the National Endowment for Democracy, the Albert Einstein Institution, um, you know, all these different institutes or uh, entities that basically, quote unquote, wage nonviolent conflict and bring about these color revolutions around the world for like regime change. Well, we're just taking their model and basically applying it for an anti-imperialist perspective. So when they, um, you know, when they do a color revolution, um, what do they say? Enough. Like Canvas teaches these people, uh, National Down for Democracy, all these different groups, they teach them to, and uh, Albert Einstein Institution, they teach them to use the word enough and then to use the, the red salute, which they co-opted. And they always do the hat, the, the, the symbol of, you know, like with the, with the fist. Um, and then um, they bring about a color revolution. They pick a color. Well, we have a color. We have purple. Um, so it, doesn't, it doesn't represent one country because, pur- you know, pur- purple is a, a very... Simon, I want, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I need, to, I need to interject really quick here um, because we, we, we're <laughs> moving forward. This is, this is the beautiful thing about having, you know, having a robust uh, grassroots, uh, you know, an international uh, a panel here is that there's so much here. There's so much to be, to, to, to be talked about. But I just wanted to shift just the conversation just a little bit because, again, we're moving into uh, one o'clock. Um, there are some questions that uh, there are. Uh, there are some questions that I'm gonna try to make sure I kind of synthesize. But I also want, to, uh, you know, Simon. One of the things that you you actually show, which is very important here, is you know this coordinated effort at the grassroots level and the international level to actually address in a substantive way sanctions and you know the things that are happening. And, and you're providing, you know, which was one of the segments of conversations I wanted everybody to talk about uh, is, is how can we, you know, really develop a, a united front? Uh, how can we understand the particularities of the conditions in our, in our particular nations, in our communities, and also develop a united front, non-alignment? And there's a non-alignment movement. There was a Bandung conference. There was a number of instances within which uh, you know, uh, you know, folk were attempting, uh, coming out of decolonization, coming out of um, anti-apartheid, coming out of, you know, Jim Crow, who was attempting to address these particular issues. So as we're thinking about that, I want to, I want to just uh, go to the, uh, if you have any questions for any of our, uh, our, our panelists, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'm sorry. If you have any questions for any of our panelists, please, by all means, put them in the, the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen. But I wanted to, uh, just try to at least pull one question. It looks like there's a question for Zimbabwe. Uh, um, and the question, I'm going to synthesize it here, is how would sanctions look different if sanctions only impacted those targeted? Uh, that's a very interesting question because that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I mean, you know, sanctions are going to go target more than just the folk who are impacted. And as for Zimbabwe, and I guess, Rotundo, if you can give like a little, uh, maybe like one or two minute, uh, if you can, it's like I said, it's a very complex section, uh, a question. And then there is a, uh, there's a question that we'll go to. So Rotundo, please, for all means. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, sanctions, if they were targeted, would still not be a different, would not, still not have a difference because if the targets are being punished without a trial, that would still mean that the sanctions are illegal. And generally, when they target sanctions, they target the most important people in a society, your biggest investors, the richest people in the society, politicians. So what this does is that your investors that are supposed to invest in industry, supposed to invest in production, creating jobs and paying the taxes to government would be targeted by those sanctions. And so they affect your government's tax, uh, tax revenue collection. They affect the ability of government to give uh, civilians enjoyment of their basic human rights and the creation of facilities for those people. And it affects job creation, affects the economy. So it wouldn't make much of a difference. And before I finish, I need to reiterate that any punishment that does not have any hearings, that does not have anybody being found guilty, that does not give people opportunity to defend themselves from the charges that are being caused for them to be punished by sanctions are illegal, 
they are a violation of the Universal Bill of Rights, and they are a contravention of human rights. So they are illegal and should not be allowed, should not be accepted. And we actually had the U.S. Um, sending somebody who pretended to be a lobbyist. This is actually a member of the CIA who wanted to find out from us if we are comfortable with the removal of sanctions on the civilians and the maintenance of sanctions on the uh, targets. And so we said to them that we are not comfortable with any sanctions that are collective punishment or individual punishment of important people of our society without trial and without a due process. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and, and as folks see we, um, in the middle of my screen, I have, I have Obi Agunia Jr. who's here, who I must make sure, uh, you know, he's the one who brought everybody together. It's just basically like in basketball, there's a lob he threw up uh, for us and, um, you know, bringing, uh, bringing everyone together. And I just want to make sure before I actually bring him into the conversation, I wanted to, uh, uh, there's, a, there's another question here that the first part of this question really gets into the crux of what I think is what I think is important in these discussions uh, is what can be done. What are some substantive things? And again, Simon provided those aspects. We have historical, uh, you know, from Cuba, uh, from Venezuela, we have historical uh, uh, continuities or traditions of addressing these things. But what are some things that you know, maybe one or two things each of the panelists and um, you know, think that can be done because the question that was posed is, is the world set up in such a way that sanctions cannot be overcome through cooperation by non-Western countries? That's a, again, these questions are very loaded, you know, they're very complex and very, uh, but also the, you know, the way that these sanctions are developed, the, you know, the ideas and the, and the targets are very important. So what are some, you know, Simon gave us, uh, you know, some, um, some, some examples of the No More Movement but what are some, in your opinion, uh, you know, particularly from Cuba and also from Venezuela, what are some things that people can do, you know, uh, some substantive things that people can do to, to, to address the the uh, the violent implications of? And we'll go with Fabria if she if she's there if she's available uh, for Venezuela, and then we'll look, uh, go to Cuba. Of course, Cuba has a long history, but what are some substantive things for those who are not? aware of the things that we're actually talking about today. Hi, yes, I'm here. And I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm just about to enter our session here at the National Assembly. So I was receiving some calls. So uh, could you repeat what you want me to talk about? The, it would the effect of sanctions on you? Yeah, so we, so we wanted uh -huh. to get, we wanted to give maybe one or two, one or two, uh, two ideas, uh, substantive ideas that, you know, folk can do to actually, because these conversations really become very big yeah. conversations. But yeah. What are some substantive things that, you know, folk can do? Well, anyone like denounce, denounce how are the impacts of the sanctions on people? Most of the panelists today have, have been very clear on how sanctions are implemented. We call it in my country uh, unilateral coercive measures. Actually, we don't call them sanctions because they are a uni uh, unilateral decision, as the ambassador said, and also the other panelists. And uh, they affect the, the whole population in every country, and they affect their right to access equally any opportunity. So we need more, uh, in the case of Venezuela, at least, and almost as, as it happens in the Cuban case, because they have been struggling for more years against the blockade. Our, our coercive measures are beginning to look like a blockade also for Venezuela. Uh, is denounced. We need support. We need support. We have the numbers. There is a report, and actually for the UN special rapporteurs, uh, on Venezuela, I could send that uh, maybe in the chat or maybe to an email if it could be published because there will, you would have tools by an independent, if you want to call it like that, an independent source of information that came to Venezuela and was able to see by herself and uh, 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 interview with the people, with every sector in government and outside government, even the opposition 
and the people in general in Venezuela to see how they affected economically in health and in social issues in the social area. So we need that denouncing. I think never is enough. And every day we have different, um, different versions from each side. And of course, the, the, the most known version is the mass media is the one of the mass media controlled by the governments, the biggest governments, about what is going on and what really happening in every in every country. I would ask for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Ambassador Vim. Well, in the case of Cuba, uh, <clears throat> there has been a solidarity movement for many years uh, uh, fighting against the blockade, not only here in the US, but around the around the world. Uh, for example, nowadays you have like, like, hap like what happened uh, last Sunday, a car caravans or rally around the world uh, that has been uh, carried out to, to demand the lifting of the U.S. blockade. Uh, there, there is a national net network of solidarity with Cuba in the U.S. that one of the main uh, objectives uh, of their work is to fight against the, the, the blockade in the mass media, in their uh, district, all over the, the country. Uh, there is a lot of misinformation about the situation in Cuba and the impact of the U.S. blockade. So uh, it is important that every person that knows it, uh, knows what it really happened and how the blockade impact our lives uh, talk about that with their friends, with their uh, uh, colleagues at work, and even with the social uh, media. So that is what I would like to say. Thank you, thank you. I wanted to uh, to give to give space for our friends, colleagues, and comrades for uh, for Eritrea, uh, Ambassador Salam. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what we have to do to, to, to fight the, the sanctions regime uh, is that first of all, we have to have a, a clear vision of what we want to do uh, about these sanctions and the way they are happening uh, throughout the world. Uh, and also we have to have a structure within our own countries and also internationally, uh, get organized and come up with, with the activities that uh, that can uh, promote uh, equal partnership thinking, but, uh, but the main thing that uh, each country, each uh, group in any country has to, has to have is that a free thinking. Uh, in, some, in some ways, a powerful country seems supporting another country, but there's no, uh, as, I say, as, as I say, goes, there's no free lunch. There's something that, uh, Big powers want from you if they you think they are, they are supporting. But until we get to, to, to a point that uh, we we have to live in partnership with equal uh, uh, footing, uh, keeping our dignity uh, as, as a priority as, as people, uh, it will be very difficult to, to advance. So we need to develop solidarity in terms of ideas and in terms of actions, I would say. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so uh, with that being said, I want to, I want to, I want to bring in uh, Obi, uh, if you don't mind, uh, particularly in the, in the context of this conversation as we are kind of rounding out, but I also want to make sure, uh, you know, um, for Zimbabwe, right? Uh, there is there is a lot of consternation, particularly, you know, historically uh, around addressing, you know, a number of issues. And so I wanted to look specifically at some of the substantive ways because there is a lot of work that's been done. Obi's been a part of a lot of those particular um, efforts as well, but not only in the context of of Zimbabwe, but with Cuba, Venezuela, and other things. So this is the reason why we you know, we, we decided to uh, put this panel together again to pack a lot of information in and you can pull on any strand that you want in order to understand. But I think Obi will be able to help us uh, kind of weave all of these things together in a context. And also I do believe our friends at, um, at the Eritrean Embassy wants to want to uh, show us a video too, and maybe we can get to that as well. 
but Obi, I'll just I'll just bring you right into the conversation. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, on behalf of the um, Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association, um, I'm honored to um, be here. I couldn't think of a better way to um, wrap up African Liberation Day. And congratulations to all the organized formations that organized African Liberation Day activities throughout the diaspora, um, throughout the continent. Notice we said African Liberation Day activities, not Africa Day activities, because speaking of neo-colonialism, you cannot talk about this and not talk about the direct assault on a day so special in the pantheon of our genuine resistance. We then must extend um, belated um, happy independence to the mighty people of Eritrea, who um, just had their 31st um, year as an independent and sovereign nation. So we're happy. Um, we're here. This year is very special for us for a multitude of reasons. This year, um, the Pan-African giant that led the Guinean revolution, Akme Sekoutere, would be 100 years old this year. Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the face of African resistance, transitioned to the ancestors in 1972, 50 years ago. And this year is the 30th anniversary of the Day of the African Child. So we're bringing a lot of things together. We would like to recognize Africa um, World Project for their wonderful streaming of this event. Um, the political counselor, Dawit, um, has asked me that while this was going on. So they're streamlining this right now. This is being streamed by Brother Elliot Booker and Time for an Awakening. We have some comrades from WRFG, an entity that broke away from Pacifica many years ago to be more self-determining. They will be um, having this podcast, this discussion on numerous shows that they have. We want to thank um, WRD for their efforts. And two local stations in Selma and Birmingham will be airing this um, in, the, in the upcoming few days. But we'll follow this up in writing with everybody that's here. To Ambassador um, Solomon and Ambassador Rivera, thank you for taking so much time out of your schedule to be here with us today. Um, we say that um, what we're dealing with is the different levels and layers of solidarity. At bare minimum, those who use platforms to express their displeasure about sanctions but moving now to the concretized action. The first thing that we must do is we must, um, in the challenge of um, wording, using um, one of the colonial languages brutally imposed on our ancestors, is to challenge their definition of the word. When they say that they are targeting, they target these, um, they're targeting certain individuals. That is very disingenuous because of the fact that when you have countries with a revolutionary pedigree, with a revolutionary background that are truly one with their people, if the sanctions hurt the people, it automatically hurts them. It automatically compromises them because their main objective is to empower their people with no filter. So when they say that they're targeting individuals, but, these, but this results in resources, both human and material, that can make society better then we know how bogus that is when they say they are targeting sanctions. But in the spirit of resistance, we say, we have some targets too. We must target the children of those nations. We must target the best attributes that those nations have to offer. We are with Eritrea at a moment where they are the only nation on the African continent that has free healthcare and free education for their citizens. For that reason, we must target all of the organizations to deal with affirmative action, all of the organizations that are trying to preserve historical black colleges and universities, minority colleges and universities, predominantly black institutions like Chicago State, our African independent schools. We must target them and say, build ties with Eritrea, build ties with Cuba, who has the highest literacy rate in the world, build ties with Zimbabwe, who has a 97% literacy rate in the world. So we must target them. Through the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company, our only adult play has been about the Eritrean women, guerrillas, mothers, and wives. We're the first ones in the diaspora to do a children's play about Cuba's doctors, Cuba's greatest army. We seek to have a children and children's exchange with La Colmanita, Cuba's national theater ensemble. And we've started that conversation with Eritrea. 
16, um, 12 years ago, Zimbabwe bestowed a responsibility on us to write for the Herald, making us the first US correspondent in their country's history. That is, so we target media. And the US Institute of Peace admits that um, Zimbabwe is winning the propaganda war against them. As a post July 26th activity, we are rallying media all over the world, African in makeup, African in composition, African in concentration, and we're going to have a private meeting with Prensa Latina, Cuba's national press outlet, so we can have a people-to-people -people solidarity press outlet. There's a discussion going on in Eritrea it, to see if we are qualified to become the national correspondent, U.S. correspondent, for their paper. So these are the ways that we seek to um, deal with these things. When we come to talk about, um, we must remember the words of Barack Obama at his first um, inauguration. He said, the might of our military must be targeted, must be extended as um, through our diplomacy. He said, the might of our military must be matched by diplomacy. So when they cannot bomb countries, their preference, when they cannot assassinate leaders, their preference, they will target those nations and bring the attempt to bring the people to the knees by the dismantling of the social infrastructure. And when you have the attributes that Cuba has, that Venezuela has, that Zimbabwe has, that Eritrea has, that is a um, declaration of war. Why would you target nations that excel in education at this moment in history? And for our people in this country, we are 12% of the population, but have the second highest dropout rate. 1.5 million children drop out of school in the United States every year. Our people are 10.3% of that demographic. So these are the things that people have to deal with. The dynamics of isolation. We cannot let any of these nations be isolated. So when we talk about building school relationships through education, building relationships through healthcare, Cuba became the champion of the fight against the corona pandemic. How can we not fight to empower their efforts in Africa? Where many people are talking about investment in Africa, I challenge anyone to find a better investment strategy than investing in Cuba's health work on the African continent, where they have 4,000 doctors strategically dispersed throughout Africa. And when they're not treating the sick, they're sitting down with the young people who have said, as an act of patriotism, they will not leave their countries and come to the United States, come to any part of the European Union. They will stay in their countries and deal with the hardship. So far, we are targeting the Cuban doctors in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, in Guinea, in Ghana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Liberia, and Guinea to begin this process. There is no reason why we can't look for creative ways to support that particular effort. We want to thank Cuba, Venezuela, and Eritrea in particular for their stance of the United States Agency for International Development. President Afwerki threw them out in 2005 through the Bolivarian Alliance of Our Americas, Cuba, Venezuela, Haiti, Suriname, and Venezuela said they have no place in the Americas. But when you do something like that, you have to provide an alternative. Lastly, we come to see how they manipulate language. We remember Cyclone had died three years ago, where Zimbabwe was devastated severely, Malawi was devastated severely, Mozambique was devastated severely. And the United States said, help Mozambique in any way you can. Help Malawi in any way you can. Help the people of Zimbabwe, but not the government of Zimbabwe. The former vice president of the United States for the first time in history openly went to the Organization of American States and asked for Venezuela to be removed from the process. The United States went to the United Nations to try to remove Zimbabwe from the Committee for Sustainable Development to block it when it was their time to chair it. They tried to intimidate Zimbabwe into um, accepting least developed country status where 37 of the 55 nations who have that are African nations. These are other, so these are the things that we must know if we're gonna begin to strategize. And once again, bare minimum, if people can just create platforms to express their displeasure, that's one, one thing. But today, why this is important, Instead of speaking about Cuba, speaking about Zimbabwe, speaking about Venezuela, speaking about Eritrea, which has a role, we wanted to create a platform for them to be heard, for them to be able to contextualize their challenges. 
And at the same time, we're highlighting their resolve. We say that Rutendo and Simon are the best examples of patriots when real homeland security is on display because they are 100% committed to securing their homeland. And I wanna thank Simon for inviting me and extending the opportunity for me to be on the advisory board of the No More Movement. I'm still trying to figure out how I'm qualified. But um, so these are the things that we are looking at. So once again, cultural, ties, educational ties, independent of the State Department, independent of the United States Agency for International Development. We thank the World Conference of Mayors who are gonna be hosting the deputy chief of the Cuban embassy at their convention this upcoming weekend. We wanna thank State Senator Malika Sanders Fortier of the 23rd District in Alabama for sending a resolution to the National Conference of Black State Legislators calling for normalized relations um, with Cuba. We want to thank the institutions who have expressed an interest in building a, doing a project with the Southern African Development Community Nations, Venezuela, Cuba, Ethiopia, and Eritrea to create a digital timeline to show the parallels. Sometimes our diplomats can be misled or not misled, but because they have a concentrated agenda when it comes to African diplomats. And they're thinking about investment, looking at small level business people in our community, mid-level business people, and a few who categorically are big business people. But what they must not forget is information is the first line of defense. And when the educational institutions develop projects, when health institutions develop projects, that will make it okay for the business institutions to feel comfortable because it is the everyday people who have played a role in the Cuban solidarity movement, making it comfortable for Ted Turner to lend his voice when he feels, sees fit or General Electric to lend their voice when they see fit or US right, the US rights to sit down with Ambassador Rivera when they see fit. So it is, and in a revolutionary process, we start from the bottom to the top. Oh, and I wanted to also recognize Attorney Sheree for her wonderful platform, um, Africa Esquire, who will also be running this program. So I just we just wanted to do the wrap up. We wanted to thank you all for being so generous with your time. And um, we wanna thank Venezuela for pushing this Afro-descendant movement, calling for the unity of 200 million Africans in the Americas. So Africans in the US, Africans in Colombia, Africans in Brazil, can stop saying they're Afro-Caribbean, can stop saying they're Afro-American, can stop saying they're Afro-Latino, but go back to what we called ourselves before, displaced Africans and African descendants, concentrating on the place we all have in common as we move towards oneness. So thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much for your substantive contributions. We hope that um, our efforts to complement your work, defending your nation, meets your satisfactions. We're seeking to continue to grow, continue to mature, continue to evolve as we seek to execute all the ideas we articulate following your historic and consistent example. We thank you. Thank you, Obi. And I wanted to I wanted to make sure that uh, we we just carve out just a few few minutes for anyone or each of our panelists if they had uh, maybe maybe one to two minute uh, closing. If they had anything else, you can share if you like, or if you, if we're satisfied <laughs> with our conversation today as, as, a, as a part of the tradition and the genealogy that Obi and everyone has, uh, has laid out for us. So what I would love to do is uh, give our, our, uh, our ambassador uh, colleagues and friends uh, the opportunity. We'll start with uh, Ambassador Rivera, if you had any closing comments uh, or, or anything that you would like to share as we kind of move into uh, the next phase, which is the end. No, I just, thank you. I just want to, to uh, uh, show my appreciation for the, for, uh, to Obi and uh, to your organization for organizing this, uh, this webinar to our colleague here uh, present today. In our case, it, it is always important to highlight the, the impact of the U.S. blockade against Cuba. And uh, it has been uh, important and interesting to know uh, 
the, what uh, it's happening with the, those uh, uh, sanctions that are only applying not only to Cuba, but to, to the countries uh, present here today that damage uh, heavily the, the daily life of their people as well. So thank you for having me today and organizing, organizing this uh, webinar. Thank you, uh, Professor. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> Ambassador. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was one question uh, on the chat, but I would like to use this opportunity to uh, say something about it. It was about the Eritrea and Ethiopia relations, if it's going to hold uh, as the United States pushes uh, one party against the other in that region. And uh, what I would like to say is that uh, the Ethiopia Eritrea peace and friendship agreement was an initiative of individual initiative of the two countries and two leaders. Uh, no one uh, uh, really uh, did that except the, the two countries and it's going very well. Uh, and we as Eritreans are going to work hard to, to, to make this relationship uh, uh, an excellent one. Uh, the, the thing is here, uh, Eritrea has, has been uh, pinpointed because Eritrea has been following a very independent path, uh, socially, politically, economically. Uh, and uh, some uh, countries really take it as a threat uh, uh, that Eritrea becomes uh, a bad example of good. Uh, that's why it's targeted. Uh, so uh, the tripartite agreement between Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia was really a good initiative, but still it's encountered a lot of challenges, but it's going to get uh, uh, going to get forward uh, due to the, the support of the population of the Horn of Africa to that kind of uh, independent thinking. Uh, we have a long way to go, but uh, it's very, very hopeful. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, express my appreciation to the organizers of this event. Uh, this is such a great uh, event, and we have to have uh, so many more of uh, such uh, uh, engagements so that uh, uh, we exchange our ideas and solidify our, our fight. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I wanted to uh, uh, give an opportunity to Tindo and, um, sorry, uh, uh, Simon. So we go to Tindo and then, I'm sorry, Tindo and then Simon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful platform and to the ambassadors and dignitaries that are here. Thank you for uh, joining us and giving us so much wonderful information. I was blown away by the strategy that has been employed by Eritrea, uh, Somalia, and uh, Ethiopia, the unity that they've had together and the solidarity that they've had together in the no movement that has been able to put pressure on uh, these sanctions and even to avert invasions by the United States. And I would like to say we would like to join um, uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, and other African countries in building a solidarity of all African countries. But while we're using that strategy, I would also like to challenge us to say, join us as well in the legal fight against sanctions. We need to begin to create the international law and custom of fighting sanctions and Africans standing up and getting rulings and judgments we also have to approach the UN, the UN Human Rights Council, and ask them to make rulings and to approach the International Court of Justice and the African courts so that we can begin to create the custom and practice on resisting sanctions. And we must demand reparations. As I said, the resolution 3413 actually enjoins us to seek reparations for these kind of crimes. So that's what I would like to leave us with. And I'd like to say, can we create a database for us to start communicating together, maybe a social media page or a WhatsApp page, so that we can begin to get a hold of each other and strategize about the way forward. Legal, together with this uh, digital army of resistance, is the way to go. And we all need to continue creating new strategies as we go forward and sending out information as to how these sanctions are working. Um, I just uh, want to say thank you, uh, Brother Rotendo, um, for your 
you know, your, your kind words. And I think, um, you know, this is something that we all need to do. The whole point of this today is solidarity and, um, you know, sharing best practices, uh, you know, learning and growing from one another, connecting with one another. So I'm very much looking forward to following up um, offline and after this. Uh, I also want to thank all the wonderful, um, you know, speakers today, uh, ambassadors, dignitaries, uh, thank you, Obi, for connecting all of us. Um, this is clearly a very, um, you know, it's an amazing platform and, and, uh, and an event today. And uh, I look forward to following up with you and all the others as we um, grow our bonds and, and, and uh, grow the resistance. Thank you. And thank you. And again, thank you all for, for sharing your time. We know we, we are in a, we're in a age of Zoom. We're in an age of over Zoom. We're in an age of, but also we're in an age of also, you know, using these particular mechanisms to engage in these substantive conversations that lead to actual uh, actions that, you know, again, as we're moving, you know, off offline and back into uh, real grassroots organizing. Before I forget and before I leave, I wanted to, uh, uh, our, our colleague, uh, DeWitt, uh, with the Eritrean, you had a, um, a video, and I believe you should be able to share before we leave. Um, you should be able to share. I think I allowed, I, I think. Well, let me, can I say a word or two before oh, I, absolutely, absolutely, I need to put please, it in the context of what we're discussing? I mean, this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, discussion going on. Thank you for everybody, the organizers and, and everyone who's been giving us a wonderful lecture. And one of part of this discussion, um, if, I, if I'm correct, is um, what are the community-based initiatives been taken to defeat sanctions and to null sanctions? And everybody gave a wonderful different ideas. And uh, uh, Mr. Brahane also uh, talked about strategies and our esteemed colleague from uh, Venezuela also talked about, uh, from, about uh, community um, involvement. And um, we talked about from Zimbabwe and how the legal, uh, legal uh, fights. And Simon also talked about the um, normal movements. And, and I think just one thing that I want to add is because sanctions are different to, from place to place and they all are designed and with one goal. And that goal is to bring the population down and to replace the government with a puppet regime and uh, do whatever that, you know, that whatever the agenda is. So within that context, the most important part would be the consciousness of the general population. The people understand they will not be uh, nailed down by um, media um, attacks by negative media attacks by all kinds of psychological warfare. So what I want to show is we just passed um, uh, May 24, uh, Airsha uh, celebrate this uh, 31st uh, year of independence. And that, and that celebration is not just about independence. It's about defying all odds. About this, uh, it's about standing against sanctions, standing um, against all kinds of attacks. So you see people who are born in diaspora, people who came, left the country, but at the end of the day, come united, celebrating their country, their government, their army, uh, and their policies and showing unification. So that's what I want to show. It's going to be a very uh, short clip. So uh, let me just do that. And yeah, it looks like just a dancing, but it's not. That's what I was trying to explain. So, can you see it? Yes, uh, probably needed to share the, there's a little tick on the bottom where you need to share the sound. When you're sharing your screen, there's like a little, on the shared screen, there's like a little button you have to tick. So we don't, we don't hear anything, but we see it. Oh, so you can't. Yeah, so these are like over 2,000 people just showed up on BC over the weekend, this uh, Washington, DC. Like I said, celebrating the steadfastness of uh, their country and that they've been um, you know, defeating all kinds of uh, uh, media attacks and, and uh, all kinds of uh, psychological warfare. And these are like some of them are born in America, raised in America. However, it's just, it shows you how the uh, national, the population uh, consciousness is important. 
So, okay, I'm done with that. Uh, so how do I do stop sharing? Okay. Here we go. Wonderful, wonderful. So well, again, I'm sorry for the for the sound, but I was listening, I was enjoying, I was just doing a little bit of dance on my side as well. So <laughs> but what I was trying to show is the consciousness of the people is very, very important. Without that, we can't we can't really move forward. And uh, that's that's why I want to say thank you again for for this wonderful discussion that we had. No problem. And, and again, as Obi, as Obi uh, really, the, the most important point here, uh, I shouldn't say most important, but one of the important points is, is, is providing a platform for people to speak uh, so we can really understand and engage in substantive uh, uh, idea exchange, a strategy exchange, but, uh, but really to develop a collective. With that being said, uh, we want to thank you. Yes, we are ending a little bit earlier uh, because again, this is a lot. Uh, I think, you know, you could probably use this particular uh, session for a number, a number of things. With that being said, thank you everyone for their time. And, with, and, and again, until the next time, peace be, please be safe.